Welcome. Uh, my name is Max Melman. I'm the director of the Law and Medicine Center here at Case Western Reserve University School of Law. It's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, our first uh, Elena and Miles Zaremski Law Medicine Forum of the year. Um, this is a program that is sponsored by um, um, our alum, uh, Miles Zaremski, and his wife, Elena, um, and they have uh, provided a, an endowment which uh, enables us to provide you, for example, with sandwiches and, um, and, do, uh, and, and bring people to the, the law school uh, uh, from uh, outside of the community, but also, uh, importantly, from within our community. And we're very fortunate today to have two uh, exceptional presenters from our own community, uh, George Moscarino and Howard Nierman. Um, George is uh, a founding partner in the law firm of Moscarino and, and True. Um, he graduated from this law school in 1983 um, and has had uh, has practiced for over 25 years uh, in defense of medical malpractice suits for physicians in hospitals, including university hospitals. He's a fellow of the Litigation Council of America, a life member of the Judicial Conference of the Eighth Judicial District. Uh, he's been named to the Ohio Super Lawyers Listing every year since 2005. He's a master bencher for the Judge John M. Manus Inn of Court member of the Academy of Medicine of Cleveland and Northeast Ohio's Medical Legal Liaison Committee. He's active in the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association where he serves on the Bench Bar Committee. He's an officer for the Litigation Council for the Bar's Section uh, of Litigation. He also serves on uh, our Law School Alumni Association Board uh, and he's a frequent lecturer both here and um, um, uh, nationally on medical malpractice topics and, uh, and, and legal issues. Uh, Dr. Nierman is Cass Corby Professor and Chair of the Department of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine at University Hospitals and at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Uh, he graduated from Case Western Reserve School of Medicine, following which he served as a surgical resident for two years um, before completing his residency in anesthesiology and then a fellowship in critical care medicine, both at UH. He joined the faculty at Case in 1981 as Chief of Surgical Critical Care, and in 1991 he became the first Clinical Director of Operative Services at UH, a position which he held until becoming Chair in 2000. He was also appointed Anesthesiologist-in-Chief for University Hospitals Health System in 2005. Um, he plays an active role in uh, OR management, served for many years on the board of the American Association of Clinical Directors. He's a founding member of the Council of Teaching Hospitals uh, OR Directors, uh, which has been meeting since 1994. He, is, uh, been, he has been elected a fellow of the College of Critical Care Medicine. He's also a fellow of the American College of Chest Physicians. He also holds a Master of Science degree in Biomedical Engineering and an MBA, both from Case Western Reserve University. Um, he's active in a number of state and national medical societies, and he's been named on the best doctors list continuously since 2001. Uh, he's also served as an expert witness in medical malpractice cases for almost 30 years. I'm going to turn the program over to George and Howard. Um, this is being webcast, and so um, um, we, will, uh, we will ask you if you have a comment or question, um, and as you'll see, this is uh, intended to be more of a conversation than a lecture. Uh, please come up to one of the two microphones to make your uh, comments or to ask your questions so that the people watching us at home can hear what you're saying. So without more, please welcome Howard uh, Nierman and George Moscarino. Well, th good afternoon and thanks for coming. Um, Max, thank you. I was thinking about this when we came down here to prepare, and what I thought was that, uh, you know, today there are doctors, nurses, various healthcare professionals that are encountering their patients either in the operating room, um, interpreting results, uh, in an office atmosphere, uh, in an emergency room. And unbeknownst to them, um, some of them having known these patients for a while and some never before, maybe in a less than a year they could be a defendant in a medical malpractice case. And they could wind up sitting in an office having their deposition taken, and then in a couple of years they could actually go to trial. And, and those physicians and those nurses and those healthcare professionals for which we work with in these cases um, are then going to move from the medical arena, the practice of medicine, to uh, the medical legal arena. They're going to meet some very, very good lawyers on the other side that have brought these suits and are going to question them in detail about that. 
So what I thought we'd do today, and I think we're really fortunate to have Dr. Nierman with us. I've known him for 25 plus years. Um, he's an outstanding physician, as you can tell from his CV. Uh, he served as an expert witness on both sides of the litigation, both in the plaintiff and the defense realm. And I think I should let all of you know that most importantly, on Sunday, he ran and completed the Chicago Marathon. <laughs> But, but if you looked at the paper, I wasn't in the top three finishers. <laughs> the point was that he finished. Um, so what we thought we'd do today is to try and give you the perspective without giving a lecture, without standing up and giving you the droning on what is the law of this and the law of that. We'll give you some, but to try and uh, give you a perspective is both from the lawyer's perspective and the doctor's perspectives. How do these cases unfold and how do these professionals who work in the medical arena handle getting into the medical uh, legal arena. Um, what I thought we'd do is acquaint with you with some of the key concepts, um, look at both viewpoints, and time permitting, we have a few uh, adapted case examples from cases that I've handled. Um, here's how cases start in some respect, a little bit in jest, but this is a lawyer with his briefcase at the uh, scared doctor's office giving him a uh, a lawsuit and like any case and by the way when I put these slides together um, I, I tried to keep in mind who would be the audience um, and I wanted to have it both before the law students who are here and I see people in the audience that I've handled cases with um, that I know are just as bit as an expert as I am so some of this is going to be a little bit you know below their heads so to speak but I thought we'd try and gear it to everybody and move on but you know here's the beginning of the case so I guess I'd ask you Howard how you know, do from your experience and your colleagues, how do physicians react when they all of a sudden find out from whomever they find out from their insurance company, their supervisor, in the mail, their wife, when they've been named in a lawsuit? So one of the, one of the things we learn is, uh, and forgive my Latin, is uh, something that uh, translates to first do no harm. And I mean, we're taught that from, from day one when we go to medical school. So the fact that, that uh, a patient has come to a bad outcome while we are in charge of them is is sort of disappointing and, and terrible to deal with to begin with and then having somebody tell you well it's your damn fault and you, because you practice below the standard of care which George will, will define in a minute is uh, it, it sort of adds insult to injury I mean, everybody knows when they've had a bad, bad outcome, it, it's no secret, but then the surprise comes when, uh, sometimes a surprise comes when, when you get handed the piece of paper saying, well, you know, we're bringing a suit against you for your, for your negligent care. And the word negligent, again, it's a legal term, but the way doctors interpret it means that you did something bad. And so it's, it's a bit of a, it's, it's a blow because you've, you already feel bad because the patient had a bad outcome. But then you feel bad because somebody thinks that they had a bad outcome and it's your fault. And you have to keep in mind, you know, nobody brings the lawsuit for the good result. It's like the plane dealer doesn't report the case when the plane lands safely. These are cases that are highly emotional. You've got families who believe they've been wronged, families whose loved one has either <laughs> um, died, has had a significant uh, brain injury, has had some kind of outcome. So you have that side. And then you have the physician, the doctor, the caregiver on the other side. And there is a lot of emotion and there's a lot of high stakes that are involved in these cases. They're fascinating. I've been privileged to work on them for a long time, but uh, they're complicated. I thought what I'd do um, is just give you just a very short rundown on how these cases go. Because when we meet with doctors like Dr. Newman who have not been involved in a case, we have to tell them how this is going to proceed. These cases take several years, uh, depending on what form you're in and what court. But really, number one is case selection and investigation. There's plaintiff lawyers in this audience here. This is where they do their homework. The very good ones, they look at these cases ahead of time, they consult with experts, and they decide whether the cases are worth their while to bring. Um, they have experts that review these cases. These are physicians. Under the law that we have now, the tort reform law, to file a case, you have to, or you're supposed to, file what's known as an affidavit of merit. And that's supposed to be an affidavit from a physician who's in the similar specialty of this doctor who's been sued or in the subject matter that the hospital is being sued on and that doctor is supposed to review the records and decide that the case has merit. 
After that, we have the filing of suit. I showed you the cartoon before. And then we have this discovery process that you're all familiar with either by law school or by whatever you practice in if you're in litigation. We have the gathering of tremendous amount of records. You have depositions of the caregivers. Um, and then at some point in time, under the local rule here in our county, there's a local rule that requires the plaintiff to maintain the case. They have to come up with an expert report. And that's a letter form report that people like Dr. Newman have authored for, uh, for the litigants that details what the allegations of the negligence are. After that, there's depositions of these various experts, and then there's a disposition of the case. And like any case, not just medical malpractice, it's either going to be dismissed, plaintiffs are going to give up, there's going to be an out-of-court resolution, or there'll be a trial. And that's really just kind of the short sketch on uh, how these cases go. This is just a cartoon I came up with, I saw. I didn't author it, just uh, of the role of the... Uh, of the lawyer and the doctor, and I guess what I was wondering, Howard, what, what is the viewpoint of, from the medical profession of the lawyers, and what do they think of, uh, of our profession? Well, I, I think that in, in general, they, they respect the profession, um, and like everything else, there's the, there are people who uh, harbor ill feelings because they feel that they've been wronged, that they've been handed, a, again, a, a lawsuit and said, you know, you've been negligent then you, it's hard to divorce that piece of paper and that act from the person who's, who's handing it to you. So, uh, and if you feel, if the physician feels that they didn't do anything wrong, then, then this person, this lawyer who just handed them that uh, piece of paper is gonna make their life miserable for the next two, three, four years until there's a resolution of that case. I mean, I can tell you from my own personal experience, these doctors take this very personally. Uh, yep. it, it bothers them. Um, uh, and you do have two sides to every story. And uh, depending on the doctor that you're dealing with, they, some of them literally hate lawyers. And sometimes they take um, their detest for the legal profession even against the lawyer that's representing them. Now, after you Which get we, through this and then they get to know you and they know you're on your side, you develop a great bond with these doctors when you're working to try and defend them. But uh, it is really a clash of two great professions, but it is a contest and it is really the mixing of the medical with the legal and this medical legal. It's a fascinating uh, it, it process. Took, and and I, I started off, my, my very first case was about two weeks after I'd finished my residency, and I have no idea where it came from. I don't even remember the lawyer, but it was a plaintiff's case. And um, I went to my boss, my chair at the time, and said, do we do those things? And he said, it's up to you. But, you know, it, it, being in an academic center, those are, the, those are the kinds of things, these are the kinds of things that we should look at just to, as long as we do it altruistically. But it took a while before you sort of separated the, the bad feelings from, from the people and from the experience. And you realize that it is a job and the, the lawyers are out there doing the best they can for their client, no matter which side of, of the story they're on. Uh, and I learned that over, over the years and, and, and now good friends with many of the plaintiff's lawyers, some of whom have, you know, I've, I've been up against many times. Here's really what uh, the burden of proof is in on these cases. It's really a two-fold burden of proof. The plaintiff must prove by the greater weight of the evidence, so it's not a criminal case, it's a civil case by the preponderance of the evidence, that the defendant was negligent. So whether it's a hospital for nursing negligence, it's a physician, a surgeon, whatever specialty, that that physician was negligent. That's not the end of the story. The plaintiffs also have to prove that that negligence, whatever it was, was the proximate cause of the injury to the plaintiff, or a proximate cause is the better terminology. A physician is negligent if the physician fails to meet the required standard of care. The key concept in these lawsuits, and in my experience, most of the time is spent on what is the standard of care. What was the physician supposed to do? What did he do? And, uh, you know, that's really what it comes down to. Uh, expert testimony is required on all aspects of these cases and the standard of care is discussed throughout the entire case. Howard, is there a difference in what the standard of care term is thought of in the medical sense versus what it is from your experience once we get into the medical legal arena? Well, it, it, there's where the area sort of grays a little bit, George, and, you know, the standard of care, is, as I'm sure you're going to define, is, you know, what, uh, at least from, from my standpoint, is what a reasonable and prudent practitioner uh, of health care would do in similar circumstances. Uh, and that opens the gate to just about anything because you know, just as in the field of medicine as in the field of law, there are lots of people who are reasonable that may have different ideas about how to practice. 
you know, uh, one doctor might think that uh, antibiotic A is the only treatment for this disease. Another doctor might think, well, it's really got to be antibiotic B. And the third will say, well, either one of them will do. And if you have that, then you can understand how there's going to be uh, an expert on the plaintiff's side who's going to say, this was not the standard of care. And there's going to be an expert on the defense side say, oh, yes, it was. And, you know, it's not unreasonable for reasonable people to disagree. Uh, and then you say, well, is it standard of care or is it best care? And I've often had, when I was an expert witness, had a lawyer say, well, what would you have done in this case, Dr. Nierman? And then I get an objection from my lawyer saying, it's not about what Dr. Nierman would have done or wouldn't have done, it's about what the standard of care is. So in these cases, if the plaintiff uh, proves that the doctor or the hospital was negligent and that it was the proximate cause of the injury of the plaintiff, setting aside the issue of damages, they should win. So that could either be a lawyer who's happy because he loves because he's got a satchel because he won, or that could be the plaintiff that uh, has won his case. Um, but let's go further with the standard of care concept. This is straight from the Ohio Law and Jury Instructions. The existence of this physician relationship places a duty you know Max Melman was telling me he's going to teach torts this afternoon there's the duty for this doctor to act as a physician of reasonable skill care and diligence under like or similar conditions that's exactly our circumstances what uh, Howard told you before that's what's known to the standard of care some qualifying language also in the jury instructions is that the standard of care is to do those things which a reasonably careful physician would do and to refrain or not do things that a reasonably careful physician would not do. And that is what these cases battle about when we retain experts, as to what is the standard of care, how did the doctor deviate from the standard of care, either by doing something that that expert says is incorrect or uh, failing to do something that he should have done. So then we have the issue of what is the malpractice in the lawsuit. Um, The key thing that I told you before about these cases is not just proving that the doctor deviated from the standard of care, but from the fact that there is proximate cause. And this is straight from a jury instruction um, in a case. A party who seeks to recover for an injury must prove not only, that's the key, that the other party was negligent by deviating from the standard of care, but that such negligence was a proximate or direct cause of the injury. Proximate cause exists where an act or failure to act in a natural or continuous sequence directly produces the injury or damage with or without which it would not have occurred. Now, just imagine you're sitting in a courtroom with a doctor and he's listening to this jury instruction as eight people allegedly of his peer are going to be judging him. Uh, it's, it's a difficult situation. But Howard, have you been involved as an expert in cases where you've had a case where there actually was negligence, but there was no proximate cause? Proximate cause is, you know, clearly if, if somebody comes in for an operation, they, they have an anesthetic, something goes wrong in the anesthetic, and they don't ever wake up, it's pretty, pretty good that you can determine that what proximate cause is. Uh, on the other hand, if you have somebody who has come into the hospital with <clears throat> a severe disease, gets multiple complications, goes and has six different x-ray scans, and, and is in the ICU for three months, on the ventilator, on dialysis, eventually recovers, but is brain damaged, then you say, well, where, where did the brain damage occur? And it could have occurred, you know, week one, week two, week three, et cetera. There's all kinds of incidences that are up there. Maybe one of the incidents was negligence. The rest were just complications of severe illness, and how do you prove that the end result came from that one episode of negligence. And, and that becomes difficult. Some of these cases really become uh, uh, difficult uh, mysteries in order to try to figure out to, to, how to connect the dots. And that's why the lawyers that handle these cases for the plaintiffs spend so much time looking at them ahead of time, looking at their uh, clients' past medical <laughs> histories, looking at their records to make sure that there isn't something that they missed. And that even if it was a clear deviation from the standard of care. There may be a different reason why that person died. Uh, there may be a, another caregiver that uh, they didn't include in the lawsuit that uh, really was the proximate cause. So it's, it's, a, it's a hornet's nest for the lawyers, and it's a, it's a big bone of contention in these cases as you go through them for a couple of years. All of these... I understand, but, George, is, is, you know, if there's clear negligence, but, but the patient didn't suffer any damages from it, then, then what do you have? 
Yeah, you, you don't have much of anything. So, and I'm not really here talking about damages because we'd be here for a long time. I really wanted to talk really about the burden of the proof. But obviously, like in every case, there's the negligence, there's the proximate cause, and then the plaintiff's lawyers have to prove their damages. Um, the cases that we see, there are usually damages. It's a matter of whether the, there was a proximate cause. Um, as I said, people don't sue for the right result. Most of the cases that we see that I'm involved in are, are the once-in-a-lifetime cases that physicians like Dr. Nierman see. They're usually involved with the patient with the horrible result, the death, uh, the arrest during surgery, the arrest after surgery. Um, the, the, they are usually there is something seriously wrong. And in the advent of the tort reform that we have here, it's very difficult for the lawyers to maintain these cases. They're very costly for both sides. These experts don't do this for free. They make money off of it. Uh, the average hourly rate is in between 250 to $750, $1,000 an hour. A lot of times these experts for both sides, they want money up front. Um, I'm not saying that they're all in it for the money. There's some great experts that I've worked with. But this is an expensive venture for both sides to, uh, to battle on these cases. As it relates to the expert testimony, and this is about it on the law, unless people have some questions, this is a jury instruction from a case that I tried this past <laughs> April. It was a surgery case, uh, and this was the expert witness instruction that the jury received. <coughs> and they're told that the standards of conduct and skill, which is the standard of care, that's the whole subject of the case, that is applicable to the surgeons in the same circumstances as the practitioners in this case and are not matters within the common knowledge of the jury. These are within the special knowledge of the experts in the field of surgery and they're to be proven only through the testimony of the expert witnesses. So when we do try these cases, much of the entire contest is about both sides bringing in their expert to just hone in on this issue, ask this expert what is the standard of care, ask this expert how did the doctor deviate from it or how did the doctor stay within it? And much of it's about the qualifications of these experts, et cetera. Um, Howard, anything you wanted to add on and, that? And, and that becomes, that becomes a, a real issue. I mean, it, it gets down to, uh, as George alluded earlier, it's, it's supposedly a trial by the, by the jury of your peers, but it really aren't your peers in the sense that they're not physicians, they're not healthcare professionals. They don't have the knowledge base uh, they don't speak the same language, so it becomes there. It's become how do you sell uh, this uh, this issue to these lay people, essentially non-medical personnel, uh, and it, it becomes about who's who's got the uh, you know at least in my mind who's got the best expert witness or who's got the most believable expert witness. Uh, I, I've been to trials where, um, not at my suggestion, but. Uh, the, ex the lawyers that I was working with took seven or eight of my textbooks and set them down on the desk and, and used that as an exhibit. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, I don't make up the, the, uh, I don't make up the, uh, the drama here, but this is what it gets to some points of time. The experts are very important. Um, what I've learned kind of over time, though, is that one of the most uh, important factors in the trial of these cases, and actually the prosecution of them when they get the deposition taken, is what are the doctors like? How, how likable are these doctors? And, uh, or how unlikable might they be? I mean, the plaintiff's lawyer, when they come to my office and they know they can get under a doctor's skin and that guy is, or gal is really, really angry, they, they like that. When they leave, I always tell my clients, what I want to have happen is I want this lawyer to leave and say, wow, that doctor is really, really a good person. That doctor really knows his stuff, and we're going to have a hard time at trial. We talk to the juries afterwards. Really, one of the major litmus tests is, I would let Dr. Nierman take care of me. If the plaintiff can't win that battle, they've got a tough, tough chore, absent some really gross, you know, terrible negligence. Um, what do the docs think about, the practicing physicians think about these doctors that come in and testify against them? Well, it's, it's a great question, George, and, and I think that most people, uh, if th there's a wide range of expert witnesses out there, and some of them do it because they really feel it's sort of in their duty or obligation that that they are an expert in that field, and and they really need to to share that knowledge, and it could be on either side. I mean, the our. Um, all of the medical societies say that you should, you know, in theory, if you get contacted about a case, you shouldn't really know whether you're being asked to be an expert for the 
defense for the plaintiff. You should look at the case and judge it on its facts and, and give that data back to them. Of course, that doesn't happen because well, if, if George calls me, I, I know I know what George's practice is, and, and, and if a plaintiff's lawyer calls me, et cetera. Um, but you know, a, there, most of the experts out there are very good experts, and uh, but there are a few who aren't. And you know, in doing this over the years, uh, sometimes you see recurrent names, and that they come up over and over again on the other side, and and they don't really lie, but they don't really tell the whole truth, and uh, they twist things around a bit, and, and they can do that because they're they're testifying to. Again, to a jury of people who are not experts in in that field. Then there, we can get into this later. But there's there's uh, our societies, our medical societies have uh, recognized that that happens now, and each of the societies has various rules and regulations for uh, expert witness behavior, including penalties for those, at least in anesthesia. Uh, if if I'm in a trial and the person on the other side no matter which side it is on the other side, is giving what I think is false testimony or giving an opinion that really is not the truth. I may report him to our National Society and they will investigate the case. And if, if they find that that's the case, they will uh, remove his membership from the Ma uh, National Society, which actually goes to the National Database Reporting. <laughs> So that's a, that's doesn't sound like much, but it's a very it's 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 a very big uh, stick. And, and some of the guidelines for expert witness activity are in the uh, materials that you're given, you know, at the uh, from today. The selection of the expert witness for both sides is a huge, huge part of the case. Um, I think anybody that's done this for a while has probably made the mistake of, of getting what they thought was the authority on a certain issue and then you go to meet that expert and you realize that that expert can't walk and chew gum at the same time. He may be a fabulous practitioner, but in the end, just like the doctor, I mean, he's got to be able to or she's got to be able to sell this to the jury and be likable and be credible and give the impression that they've really looked at all aspects of the case. I mean, the more you do this, the lawyers will tell you and Howard and I have talked about it. You don't want um, somebody that's telling you what they think you want to hear. You want somebody that really analyzes the case and gives you a true viewpoint. Every case that I've been involved in, they are all gray, but you need to have somebody that's going to give you the good, you know, the bad and the ugly, so to speak. Um, and, and that's what I consider when I'm asked about my opinion. That's what I sort of consider my job to be, and that is to take a look at the case and then to get back to the lawyer and saying, I, I, th I think that this is what happened. I think that this is where the standard of care was either met or not met. And I think these are the issues you're going to have with this case. Uh, even though I, I think that the standard of care was either met or not met, I still think that there are some questionable areas where there's going to be some difficulty in, in how it's presented to, to the jury. I'm, I'm not playing the lawyer here. I'm just pointing out what I think are the medical facts that may make the lawyer's job a lot more difficult. You don't need to play the lawyer, but I can tell you I've had these discussions with experts who want to be the lawyer, and, and they want to tell you, look, here's, I'm not a lawyer, but here's how I think you should argue the case. <laughs> now, you know, the older you get, the more you realize you don't know everything, and sometimes they make good points, but you want to make sure that they keep their role, which is they're supposed to be the expert witness. They're and I want to, to compliment George. He's never once asked to do neurosurgery either. So that's <laughs> yeah, <funny>. thank you. <laughs> um, well, does, questions are welcome here. We didn't want this just to be a lecture. I have a couple case examples I can throw up, but before we do that, does anybody have a question that they want to uh, throw up? Anybody? If you do, you have to, according to this webcast, assuming somebody's watching on the internet, you have to go ahead and do that. All right, so you can interrupt, but let's go through some of these case examples, and then uh, I'd welcome any questions either from the students or the uh, or the practicing lawyers that are in the audience. These uh, case examples are loosely adapted from some matters that I've had. No names, no hospitals, dates changed, but they have some loose uh, relationship to some matters I've been involved with. So here's case number, number one. Um, it's an emergency room setting, and it's the failure to diagnose lung cancer. So what happens in this case is a 68-year-old lady who has a lot of medical problems, presents to an ED, to an emergency department, in mid-April of 2007. 
when she comes in, when every emergency room record has chief complaint on it, and that's what the triage nurse and that's what the doctors are supposed to find out about, she's talking about left-sided numbness and pain in her left arm and shoulder. So like every emergency room visit, she gets an examination, she gets some tests, and in this case, she was discharged. <coughs> her discharge diagnosis was, diagnosis rather was bursitis, uh, but before that, the emergency room physician ordered and read himself a chest x-ray to look to see if there was anything there. She leaves. Um, the radiology film has to be read by a radiologist, an official interpretation. Emergency room physicians are qualified to read them, but they can't sign off on them. In this instance, this mythical case here, the um, interpretation by the hospital radiologist noted a suspicious finding, not on the left side, but on the right lung, which was not seen by the emergency room physician. He wasn't looking in that area. That's not what she was there for. <coughs> so that radiologist wrote in his report that he recommended further testing, including a CT scan, which is a more diagnostic, a more sophisticated test than an x-ray to rule out neoplasm or to rule out cancer. For whatever reason, that piece of paper never gets its way back to the emergency room, never goes to this lady's primary care physician, and she knows nothing about it. Eleven months later, she is ill. She comes to this same emergency room, and it's uncovered that she has lung cancer. She passes away within a matter of weeks, sometime after the family consults a lawyer, family files a lawsuit against the emergency room physician, the hospital, and the radiologist and says to these practitioners, you didn't diagnose my loved one's lung cancer. She's dead now. You've committed malpractice. Harkening back on what we talked about before, you didn't comply with the standard of care. And your deviation from the standard of care was the proximate cause of my mother, my sister's death from lung cancer. So then the case starts. So. I consider myself a, a pretty good lawyer uh, in modest ways, but there's not many lawyers in the world that are going to win this case on liability. This is a loser, right? So, but so what happens, George, if, uh, if the ER physician has one lawyer representing him or her, the uh, radiologist has a different lawyer, and the hospital has a third lawyer? There could be some contest of <clears throat> finger pointing and who's responsible for what um, aspect of the case. Um, and, and that is always a, a potential problem. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. In, in, in essence, this was a case, and these are kind of cases that are more system cases. These are more hospital cases because somehow this word didn't get down uh, to the practitioner for a multiple different reasons. The big question in a case like this is, and talking about proximate cause is, what type of cancer did this woman have? She had, undoubtedly, even as admitted by the plaintiff's lawyer, she had cancer when she came on April 15th of 2007 for her first visit. So the ultimate issue in the case by the oncologists and in the battle of the experts is, even if it would have been diagnosed 11 months earlier, would her outcome have changed, or was she going to die from the cancer anyway? That's one of the issues that we see, whether it's an anesthesiology case, whether it's cancer or whatever. And that would have been the defense had the case gone to trial. And when you consult with oncologists, just like any other physician, they have a bevy of literature. They've got studies. They have studies based on the size of the lesion. Uh, and that really becomes what the issue would be. Um, so that, that, was, that was one case. Any questions on that or comments, Howard? Yeah, I mean, I think that if I'm if if I'm the emergency room doctor, one is the, is the standard of care that an emergency room doctor is able to make a diagnosis of cancer off of an X-ray because he or she is not a trained radiologist, and what is the duty that they have because they haven't gotten the the film has not been officially read, they have not gotten a report yet, and the report may not actually go to them; it may go into the patient's hospital chart or may go to the primary doctor, primary physician. So they could say, I, I saw the x-ray, yeah, I missed that, but I'm not a radiologist. So that's, that's not the standard of care for an emergency room doctor. So like we talked about before, as it relates to experts, the standard of care for the various physicians is different. The standard of care for the emergency room physician 
versus the radiologist versus the oncologist. So in this case, there should have been an emergency room expert to criticize the emergency room physician, and there should be a radiologist to, to criticize the radiologist. In essence, though, I mean, I don't have to tell you anything you don't know, the radiologist didn't do anything wrong. The radiologist read the film correctly, unless there was some type of thing that he didn't use the process the right way to make sure that it got on to the people that needed to find out. So. But by the way, this, this is called a handoff error, and if you look at the uh, if you look at the data that's coming out of the Institute of Medicine now, they that is the number one cause of uh, accidental deaths in hospitals today is is communication handoff errors. And ironically, this is what's called an incidental finding case. This woman came not for anything having to do with pain in the right side of her chest not for having anything to do with lung cancer, but because of a well-ordered test by a physician, a well-meaning uh, test, she gets an x-ray. The radiologist is looking at the one thing. He knows it's left side, but he sees on the right side that there's a nodule, and he does what he's supposed to do. But like every profession, whether it's medicine, law, or whatever, communications is huge, and many of the cases that we're involved in are communication snafus, and it's our job to try and best decipher where the uh, snafu happen, and if we can battle it, and if we can win it or not. Um, is, this a, is, is this a loop because of? Excuse me. Could you come up to the mic? I know that. You know, I'm actually having trouble with Angela. Can I? <laughs> or can you just repeat the question? Yeah. <laughs> Is this a loser on, on liability yes. or on proximate cause? It, it's, a, it's an impossible case to defend on the standard of care. It's impossible for me to stand up in front of a jury and say, ladies and gentlemen, it was okay that we didn't let somebody know about this result. The rub of the case will be proximate cause and whether it made a difference in this lady's outcome or not. But to speak in terms of a handoff error, I mean, isn't this better characterized as a, as a case of negligence that may fail? Uh, as a result of not being able to establish proximate cause? Well, I, I think we're saying the same thing. I think it's a handoff error. I think it's negligence, but I think that the case would come down to whether or not um, it was the proximate cause of this lady's death. And it wasn't negligence by each and every party, but these lawyers who represent the plaintiffs, they're duty-bound to represent their client the best they can, and they have to. Um, they got to sue everybody at the beginning to make sure that they're not exposing themselves to what's called an empty chair defense or for one doctor to say that the other doctor did something uh, incorrect. Okay? Any other questions on, uh, on that example? Okay, let's move on to uh, case number two. Uh, this is an urgent care setting case, so keep in mind that all of these cases are different depending on where the setting of the potential negligence would be, whether it's an office, an emergency room, a surgery suite, or whatever. But this is a delayed diagnosis of stroke. Um, so in this case, um, sometime after 9.30, a young man presents to an urgent care, and he has complaints of feeling dizzy. He's got blurred vision, shaking, twitching, and slurring of speech. That's his historical information. He tells the people when he comes into the urgent care, which is different than an emergency room. Um, we've all probably been to urgent cares, but he tells the people there that these symptoms began at work two and a half, some hours before, and he's had similar episodes in the recent past. So he is treated by an urgent care physician and some nurses. They observe him. Uh, they give him an exam, and the urgent care physician orders a CT scan of the head around noon, which was negative for acute bleeding. However, she's watching this guy afterwards, and she sees that he has a major change in condition. He's got now obviously slurred speech. He's got a facial droop, and she believes he's got an emerging stroke. So she transfers him to a suburban hospital around 1230. So that's about five and a half hours after the onset of his symptoms. He goes to this other hospital, and after being there for two hours, they send him down to um, a downtown hospital or he's then diagnosed with stroke. So in this case, the plaintiff himself, this uh, young unmarried guy, sues the urgent care center, and he sues the physician that was working at the urgent care center, and he sued the suburban hospital. He did not sue the downtown hospital that diagnosed him with stroke. All these cases, and I highlight the times, times are huge in these cases. We're always looking at time, evolvement of time, 
what went on when you were presented with the situation, et cetera. Um, Howard, any thoughts on, on this case? Yeah, the, it, and clearly what, what's at issue here is uh, we're able to rescue people who are having impending stroke and there's a certain uh, time, f uh, a certain window of opportunity that you have to try to put in some clot busting agents and that window was shut here because of the failure to make a diagnosis. Um, uh, but, but George is very true about time. I mean, uh, when you go back as an expert to try to figure out what happened, you're often left with, with a chart that may not be complete. Uh, I'm looking at a, at a case right now, not in the local area, um, for a defense uh, lawyer about a, a case where there was a, an actual code during transport to and from a, a radiology, and they lost the code sheet. So there's no record of, of when the code started, when it stopped, what agents were used to resuscitate, and they're, they're, they're suing about that he was inadequately resuscitated. Well, you don't have the code sheet. How can you tell what happened? <clears throat> so you have to go back and reconstruct events, and some of the times are not necessarily uh, uh, congruous. Some of them are, are disparate because people look at their watch or they look at a clock or they look at their cell phone, and they record different times for different events. And when you're, uh, when you're trying to piece together what happened and to make a case that something wasn't done in, in an appropriate time frame, uh, you really, it's, it's very critical that you have accurate, uh, accurate charting. So in this case, unlike the last one, this is a defendable case. I mean, this is a case for various reasons. Here's a man who doesn't show up to the urgent care center until he's had symptoms for two and a half hours. So given this time window, of stroke agents that Dr. Nierman mentioned, there's already uh, an issue as it relates to proximate costs. Um, secondly, he'd had, he had similar episodes in the recent past, and that's contra to the usual stroke presentation, which is sudden. So this would be a case where the plaintiff would need an urgent care physician to um, criticize this urgent care doctor, and the plaintiff would likely need a neurologist to, uh, to tie in things from the stroke perspective. Uh, again, the standard of care is for what an urgent care physician should see. Uh, it's, I'm reticent in all cases to blame the patient because juries don't like it, but it's unusual if you think you're having a stroke to go to an urgent care. Now, I, that's just my standpoint. I don't know if that would have held up in court or not, but this would have been a case that would have been uh, a, a, of some major contest as it relates to both the standard of care for what this urgent care physician did and also um, as it relates to causation. The reason I reference what happened at that suburban hospital is that suburban hospital didn't do anything for this guy for two hours either. And if there was going to be some argument by these plaintiff's lawyers that the uh, urgent care physician had dropped the ball, so to speak, then we would be able to say that uh, there was similar treatment uh, later on and the stroke diagnosis was not made until later on. So all of the players in these cases are looked at carefully, both by the plaintiff and both by the defense lawyers. As so that we can evaluate, you know, who are the real culpable parties, you know, if anybody. Any questions on, uh, on this one? Okay. This one is uh, pretty much right up uh, Dr. Nierman's alley because it is an uh, anesthesiology case. This is case example number three. This is a post-operative arrest and death in the PACU. PACU meaning the post-anesthetic or anesthesia care unit where you go after surgery. So this case, and again, I've changed the ages and the names and even some of the surgery, et cetera, but it's a case of a 38-year-old male. Age is always important in these cases for a variety of different reasons, and the health history of these patients is always paramount in evaluating what we're going to deal with. But anyway, this 38-year-old male with a history of morbid obesity underwent an uncomplicated gastric bypass surgery. That's a surgery that has been so great for a lot of people that changes their lives regarding the size of their stomach. He is uh, at 2.35 p.m. Again, time is huge. This patient who's still intubated, Howard can talk about the medicine a little bit as far as anesthesia, and we've all either had anesthesia or have relatives that have had anesthesia, but he's got a breathing tube still in him. He's transferred to the PACU by the nurse and the CRNA. So that's a nurse who was in the operating room. A CRNA is a certified registered nurse anesthetist. I got it right. Correct. And uh, that's who helps Howard in anesthesia cases. So they wheel him down at 235. Shortly after he gets in this PACU, he becomes diaphoretic, which is sweating. 
his blood pressure skyrockets, and he begins to thrash about. These are the kind of cases we get involved in. These are the nightmare cases for the practitioner. He begins moving about, moving about, and the support staff, these, these, these other folks, without the anesthesiologist, attempt to stabilize the patient, and eight minutes later, the anesthesiologist is paged to the PACU and arrives shortly thereafter. The anesthesiologist and the CRNA are at the head of the bed. They're trying to calm this guy down. They're trying to keep his breathing to him in, but it becomes dislodged. And this is a problem for an anesthesiologist. He's got to make a snap decision, which is what all these healthcare providers have to do in these instances. And he uh, decides, the anesthesiologist, that he's going to take the rest of the tube out. At that point in time, they have to decide, and Howard's much more adept at telling you about this, as to what do you do? Is this man able to breathe on his own? Is he going to be okay, or do we need to reintubate him? They attempt to reintubate him. There's some equipment issues from the hospital's perspective, and eventually he's reintubated, but he crashes. He crashes, they try for an hour to bring this young guy back, and he doesn't make it, and he dies. So then, they consult with a lawyer. I'm not saying they shouldn't. They file suit against the hospital. They file suit against the CRNA. They file suit against the anesthesiologists. And the theories in the case, as you can see, probably just by thinking, are timing. There are issues as to whether the man should have been extubated before he was brought to the PACU, issues about how long it took to page uh, the anesthesiologist, how long it took him to get there, and issues about what methodologies they used after this man extubated himself. They said he shouldn't have been in the position where he was able to do that, and then they always say when they have alternative theories, when they have qualified experts, that once the problem was encountered, they didn't handle it correctly. This is a difficult case. So this case, if I was asked to review it just on that, I, I could, you could go one or two ways, say it's perfectly defensible, there's great explanations for each one of those things, or you could turn around and say they just, this is the worst botched case I've ever seen. And it could go either way. Why is it perfectly defensible? Well, when people wake up from anesthesia, they sometimes go through a, sort of an excitement phase. They're, they're waking up. They're not sure. They're a little disoriented what they are. The agents have partially worn off. Uh, they may be in some pain. They're not used to having a breathing tube down, so they're, they're, they're uncomfortable. They're thrashing about perfectly normal. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, and how would you treat that? Well, an experienced PACU nurse would recognize that, would give them a little, would, would ask them, are they comfortable, are they in pain, uh, is it too bothering them, may give them a little bit more pain medicine in the hopes that they'll calm down and wake up a little bit better. Uh, on the other hand, thrashing about may be a sign of low oxygen in the blood. This is somebody who's not getting enough oxygen because the tube has be became dislodged in transport, which is a known complication and they may not be getting enough oxygen in the brain, and they're panicking because they can't breathe. And that's why they're thrashing about. And since the tube is in, or blocking the, the vocal cords, how do you tell which is which? Uh, and that's, that's a judgment call. The, uh, <clears throat> the, the timing, eight minutes, eh, eight minutes isn't bad. I mean, eight minutes, you know, for the nurse to be getting the patient settled down. I mean, remember, remember the patient arrived at 235. They, didn't, they may not have started thrashing about till 237 or 238. They may have tried some of the calming down, and they may have given them a little bit of medication. And within eight minutes of the arrival, they're already summarizing, summarizing for help. That's not bad. I, I think that that's probably uh, you know, within, within the standard. On the other hand, eight minutes may be an eternity if, if things are going wrong and the PACU nurse doesn't recognize that, that they are. Uh, going, then, then it becomes uh, you have adequate uh, health care professionals at the bedside, and now they have to make, a, as George said, a snap judgment. And the, the one thing about anesthesiologists this is why we're uh, characterized as a high-risk profession is we, we've got about three minutes to figure out what's going on with the airway until the patient's family gets really mad at us. So, uh, you know, we don't have time to go to the library and, and make a differential diagnosis. We've got to do something. We've got to do it quickly. Um, and the reason the tube was, you know, they can make the case the tube should have come out. No, the reason the tube's in there is because patients who are morbidly obese who have the surgery often have a lot of extra tissue around the neck and face, and getting the tube to go down into the right spot may be difficult, and you don't really want it out until the patient is fully awake and able to what we call control their airway. You'd want to make sure the swelling is down and, and they, they, they're awake enough so that the muscles that they use to keep their 
uh, th their uh, airway open are, are uh, under their control. So having the tube in is not, not a bad thing. It's probably a very conservative, safe thing to do. Uh, and if the tube happens to come out, uh, or if they make the decision that this tube isn't working and pull it out, they may not be able to get it back in. I mean, you know, the, the, the anesthesiologist's nightmare is failure to intubate, failure to ventilate. I can't put the tube in because I can't see where it goes, and I can't squeeze air in there because the patient has a, what we call a bad airway. So, I mean, the, the, the plaintiff's lawyers will say, well, somebody got the tube in at the beginning of the case, therefore it's only an hour or two later, they should be able to do it. Whereas the defense expert will say, well, there's, by putting the tube in, they caused some swelling, there was all kinds of tissue edema, and therefore, it's, you know, it's, it's a bad complication, but it's not outside the standard of care. So the chore in this case, like every case, which is interesting, is then when you're defending a case like this, you're literally going to be interviewing these witnesses and helping them prepare for depositions, and you're going to be talking about a time period from 2.35 p.m. probably until no more than 2.55 to 3. And you're recreating every single step that happened both based on what's documented in the PACU record and in the anesthesia record and based on what these people remember. And, and the typical scenario here is, to, uh, is you will take depositions from the PACU nurse, from the CRNA, from the anesthesiologist, whatever el other healthcare professional may have been in the vicinity, and you'll get four different time scales. Right, and that's the chore. I mean, you'll have a tremendous lawyer on the other side who is going to be grilling these folks on every single thing they did and what they remember and it's like everything it's your classic example if we all went out and we we did one of these things on the car that passed by the law school what color it was or whether the light was red we'd have a bunch of different examples and that's why the cases are difficult they're difficult for the other side and they're also difficult for the defense but this is a case that uh, involves anesthesiology experts for the most part because um, the surgeon wasn't uh, alleged to have done anything wrong. This is really the anesthesiologist's purview. Uh, it's a defendable case, but in our world, it's a risky case too because it's a very young man. And you know we're not really getting into damages today, but the age of these folks is important. I'm not saying that the age of a 75 or 80 year old person is not, uh, that's not worthy of a lawsuit, but when you start thinking about the damages aspect and when these folks who are the plaintiff's lawyers, they come up with their damage reports and they're able to say what a 38-year-old man would have earned over the course of his career, which is a compensable damage. That's a significant high-stakes case to defend. It's, it's, it's also difficult to defend because, well, for example, uh, if, if I'm practicing as an anesthesiologist or if I'm practicing as a critical care doctor in an ICU, where do you think my chances of getting sued are better? In the ICU or in the OR? In the anesthesiologist. You're right. It's, it's being an anesthesiologist. Why? Because um, in the ICU, you're making decisions out of first moment. Well, in, as an anesthesiologist in the OR, um, you are basically um, having a chance to plan your um, things by checking out his weight, et cetera, and you can plan what you're doing. I mean, you have the opportunity to plan for it as opposed to um, but, having but, to do it by the seat of your pants. <laughs> I think that, uh, I, I, that that's true, uh, but partly it's, it's all, there's another reason, is because in the OR everything's supposed to go well. You're supposed to go to sleep, you're supposed to wake up, and you're supposed to go home or to the floor. And when you get admitted to the ICU, you're supposed to die because that's where sick people are. So the expectation by, by the family and the understanding of the level of care is very different. That's because they're not all as good as Dr. Nierman. <laughs> so it's a high, no, it's, it's a high risk job. I mean, you, you, don't, you don't have a lot of time to sit and make decisions. All right, we're running short on time. Any questions? Peter. I, I made a couple of notes here, and I, I just want to uh, relate back to this whole affidavit of merit issue. And I, I really would like Dr. Dierman's spin on this, or you know, answer to this. As a plaintiff's lawyer, uh, where we're, we're required to have an expert review the records prior to suit and have that expert 
prepare an affidavit of merit, I think you can see from the presentation today that the chances of getting a real sense of what happened usually does not occur within the records, but rather occurs after you've had an opportunity to get beyond the records and hear the story of the various practitioners who were involved. And so <clears throat> what the rule then requires us to do is to really get an affidavit of merit from somebody who's not completely informed. And what that causes, as a result of what the many things that George has, has talked about in terms of uh, the plaintiff's lawyer protecting his rear end, <laughs> is the need to sue as many people as we can because we don't have the full story. And so I'm just interested, Dr. Nerman, from your perspective, uh, how you feel about this rule and what effect it has on litigants. So I, 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 I've been around long enough to understand that, that, that that's the way that, that, you, plaintiff, that the plaintiff's lawyers have to act in that, in that manner. And uh, so, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm chairman, I see every malpractice suit that comes across, names anybody in our faculty that comes across. And, you know, you see where 10, 15 people are named by name, and then there's at least another 10 Jane or John Doe's. Uh, because you don't have the whole story, and and my faculty sometimes will get all panicky. I don't, I don't even remember this case. Nothing happened while I was in the OR. It happened two weeks in the ICU. I said, you don't understand. The lawyer's doing his or her job now, and it's their job to include everybody until all the facts of the case are squared away. I said, please don't worry about it. I'm sure that you were fine. Just just treat it as if, you know, just another nuisance that, that will be dealt with at some point in time later. Well, we have to stop now. I want to thank all of you for coming, and I want to thank George and Howard for giving us an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.